hello and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. Today we are beginning a new chapter, chapter 5 of this uh, series uh, entitled Two Obstacles to Healing. And if we remember in our previous sessions we talked about false obstacles to healing in chapter 4 and today we're beginning to talk about true obstacles to healing. And they are a little bit fewer than the false obstacles, there are just four of them. And the first one we're going to talk today about is lack of knowledge. And if you have your Bibles ready to read, I would like to begin by reading a passage from Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translation you have available. Let's read it together. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being a priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I'll, I also will forget your children. Amen. A lot of people today are sick and die unnecessarily because they don't know the word of God about healing and how to use that word to get healing. And I want us to notice in this passage what this passage doesn't say. Many times we can learn a lot of things from what the Bible doesn't say than from what it says. And the, uh, the first and foremost, God doesn't say in this passage that my people are destroyed because I decided not to bring my promises to pass. Second, the second thing that God doesn't say here is that my people are destroyed because I wasn't paying attention when the enemy attacked them. I was asleep, I took a nap, I took a break. God doesn't say that here. The third thing that this passage doesn't say is that my people are destroyed because they messed up a little bit and I was a little bit upset with them. God doesn't say this in, in this passage in Hosea. But what does it say? It says that my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. Notice also that God is not talking about other people. He talks about his people, my people. Who are his people today in the New Testament? Christians, of course, believers, born again believers. We are his people. We are his chosen people, his precious possession. Now, is it God's will that his people be destroyed? No, of course not. It's not his will. But there's a very prevalent and very common doctrine going around today in, different, in some churches that if it's God's will, it will happen. No, it's wrong. It's false. Not everything that happens to us, especially the bad things, are in God's will. They are not in God's will because God does not want his people to be destroyed. Amen. Now let's see in the second half of this verse why God's people were destroyed. What does the passage says? say? That they have forgotten the law of God. They forgot the law of God. Now these people are in the Old Testament. And they didn't have the Bible or the word of Christ like we have. But they had the law of Moses. And the passage says that they have forgotten the law of God. The law that, that, that could have given them life or death. They forgot that law that gave them life. And because of that, because they, they didn't have knowledge of that law, the Bible says that they were destroyed. Now, is, is that God's fault? Did God decide that he wanted them to be destroyed and hid the law from them? No, of course. So it's not God's fault that they were destroyed. It was their fault because they have forgotten the law of God. And the same applies to us. If we don't know the word of God, then we are destroyed. And it's not God's will to be destroyed. And it's not his fault that we are destroyed. Let's read also 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where Paul, Apostle Paul says this. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. What does that mean? It means that ignorant people will get taken advantage of by the devil. If you're ignorant of Satan's devices, he will take advantage of you and me. Now, does that mean it's God's will for him to take advantage of us? No. In fact, 
The reason why Paul says this verse is so that the devil will not take advantage of us. That's, that was his purpose. He didn't want the devil to take advantage of us, to benefit from us. Now, what does the devil do? How does he take advantage of us? The Bible says that he steals, kills, and destroys. So when all these things, negative things, happen in your life, that, that's the work of the devil. And that's how he takes advantage of you. He tries to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy you, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your, your family, to destroy your job, to destroy your health, your prosperity, to put things in your way. That's how he is. And that's the work of the devil. And Paul says here that the reason why all those things happen is because we're ignorant of his devices, of his strategies, of how he works. That's called lack of knowledge. And ignorance or lack of knowledge doesn't mean that you're stupid or you're not smart. It just means that you don't know certain things. You are not aware of certain things. You don't understand the process and how the devil beats you. So you're here in the natural realm, looking only at what you see, praying and asking God to do something. But what you don't see is how the unseen realm works and how Satan beats you and me before we even start the fight. Because we're not aware of his strategies so many times and we don't understand how he comes to us. But by the Holy Spirit and by the power of God and through His Word, we can know His strategies, His devices. We can know if we're really interested. And you don't hear these things taught too much in the church today because they don't seem very encouraging. They tend to discourage people because all of a the sudden they discover. So you mean I let that happen? It wasn't God. That was me. I am the one being taken advantage of because I am ignorant. Yes, just for clarification, yes. I know it's hard to receive that. It's difficult for you to receive that, but that's the truth. Most of the times we are, we are taken advantage of by the devil because we don't know. We, have, we lack knowledge in the word of God and how Satan works and how the things of God work. And we see also the devil coming to Jesus when he was tempted. With, and he came to Jesus with the word. The devil was smart. He took Jesus on the pinnacle of, uh, of the temple and said to him, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And I love how Jesus replied to him. Yes, that's true, but it's also written. That's extraordinary. That's amazing. And we need to learn that from Jesus. What does that mean? That means he knew the word more than the devil. The devil said, it is written. And Jesus said, yes, but it is also written. And he wasn't ignorant thinking that just one verse in the Bible was the word of God. It wasn't. And he knew that the whole word, what, what the whole word of God was saying, not just one verse. If Jesus hadn't known more than just that one verse, he might have thought it was a good idea to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple. But he knew more than that. He could have said, I'll just prove to you right now, I am the Son of God. But no, he said this, it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And we need to know the, Lord, the, the word of God as Jesus knew it. We need to know the also, what the word also says. And a lot of things are not also taught today. And that's sad. That's not good. And we don't know what it also says. All we know is that we pray and it doesn't work. But we don't ever stop to ask, why God? Why didn't this work? Why? We need to stop and ask why this didn't work. And when, when we hear a good word of God that says something, don't let just one verse or just one passage dictate your theology. Now let's read one more passage from John chapter 8 verse 32 where Jesus says this. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We need to know this book, the Bible, the word of God. We need to stay in this book and find out why things happen and why they don't happen. That doesn't mean that God will tell you everything why it happened and why it didn't happen. But he will tell you some things. He will show you some things. 
You know something is going on and you might say, oh, I'm just going to pray and God will show me exactly what the reason is. Well, he may or he, he may not all the time. He may not show you why certain things happen. Where your life is concerned, he probably will at some point tell you, but not right away. Because sometimes we are even us, we are not ready to receive certain revelations and certain things from God. And he is merciful to us. He waits for the right time. So he might not tell you all the time the reason, but then when other people are concerned, most of the time he will not disclose too much because it's not our business to know why, why, why things happen to other people. Amen. He will keep it for himself, but he may show us whether we handled it in the right or the wrong way, a certain situation. And that's important for us to know if we handled it right by faith, in understanding, in knowledge, where we didn't. And uh, that might be a reason for why things didn't happen the way we expected them to happen. Someone might say, well, if these things are true, then why did that happen? You mean you will tell people at a funeral when someone died that it happened because of this or that reason? No, I will not tell them because I don't know everything going on in that situation. I don't know all their backgrounds and hearts. I don't know what they said or what, or what hasn't been said. And I will not judge that. But what I do know is that God has spoken to us promises that he wants to come to pass. And he also told us why they are not coming to pass. But I cannot tell in any given situation necessarily what the reason was. So let's not try to judge individual situations. Sometimes it may be easy to judge and to examine and see what the reason was. But other times it may be more difficult and there, there can be a lot more to it that we think there is. So we need to refrain from judging in, certain, in these situations. Plus, even if I was right on point, even, even if we were right on point, that's probably not the right time to talk about it. Usually people in these situations need encouragement, need comfort because they just lost the battle. They don't need me to go and tell them it was your fault that this happened. Is that right? Because they need encouragement, they need love in that time. And we need to be careful not to become judges instead of brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if it, even if it was our fault, our unbelief in a, in a situation like this, we need to encourage each other. We need to lift each other up so that we will win the next battle. battle. We, will, we will win the next fight. Amen? That's how God is. Even when we fail, even when we do mistakes, He lifts us up. He encourages us. He props us up and, and, and says to us, go fight and win next time. You are an overcomer. And that's what we need to do to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So that was the first true obstacle to healing, our lack of knowledge and how, how important it is, how vital it is to know the whole word of God, the whole counsel of God in order to, to know Satan's devices and in order to overcome him successfully. The second true obstacle to healing is traditions of men. And I want us to read the passage from Mark chapter 7 verses 5 to 13. Where it says this, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. 
Did you notice this last phrase? You make the word of God of no effect through your traditions. Traditions of man is another major reason for people not getting healed today. The traditions of men and elders make the word of God of no effect, zero. Can you get that? Of no effect. Traditions, culture, things that we hear from other people, from other Christians, sometimes, many times, make the word of no effect, make healing of no effect in our lives. These traditions, what are they? Are wrong beliefs about healing that need to be destroyed and replaced with good beliefs. And that is what we're doing through this series. We're teaching the good beliefs, what God says about healing. We are destroying all the myths and the sacred cows about healing, all the lies about divine healing that the devil used to stop us. How? He, he came through people, through books, through different sermons and put doubts in our minds. Put things, wrong beliefs about healing that stopped us from seeing healing happening on a more regular basis. And we're putting the truth about healing from the word of God and replacing human traditions so that the devil wouldn't be able to throw at you doubts anymore. When you know the word of God, the devil will not be able to bring doubt anymore to your mind. Amen. And an example of tradition of man making the word of no effect in regards to healing is the actual prayer for healing in itself. When a believer prays for healing of himself or for someone else, that, that in itself can be an obstacle in not seeing results. Why? Because usually that prayer would take the form of imploring God to do the healing as if God has to be convinced to do it. That's why it would be an obstacle, because we're trying to implore God to heal someone as if God would need to be convinced. And that is not a prayer based on truth. It's not a prayer of faith, because it's not based on the truth of God about healing. That's unscriptural. First and foremost, we don't need to ask for healing from God because he has already given us. And second, we don't need to convince him to give healing. Because he has already been convinced. We don't need to implore him. We are sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. A son doesn't beg his parents for food. Amen? The parents provide the food for him. And they want to give food to their children. And the same is with God. He doesn't need to be convinced. To give us healing. He has already given us healing. That's why praying to God for healing. It's unscriptural. And we don't see that in Jesus. In Jesus' whole ministry from Matthew to John. There is not even one place in the Bible. Where it says that Jesus prayed for the sick. He didn't pray for the sick. It only says that he laid his hands on the sick. And healed them. Or commanded healing to take place. He commanded the sick to be healed. Be healed. Your faith has made you well. Or he laid his hands. Those are the two main ways how Jesus healed the people. He laid his hands and he told us also in Mark 16 to do the same thing. Or he commanded healing to come in their bodies. He commanded. He, he gave words of command. He also commanded demons to be gone. He didn't pray to God to come in and deliver people from demons. So when we minister to the sick, we don't implore God to heal. Neither we pray for healing. That's not the right prayer. It's not biblical. We either command healing to take place or we lay our hands over the sick people, the sick persons. These are the ways that the word shows us uh, to minister healing. The closest we get to someone praying for healing, and this is not with Jesus, but with the apostles, is in the book of Acts. It's the account where Peter is brought to raise Tab 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 Tabitha in Acts chapter 9. And there it says that he prayed first, then he got up and turned towards her and raised her from the dead. Even there, he wasn't praying on her or for her. He was praying, the Bible says, but the Bible doesn't tell us what he was saying. Amen? So nobody can claim that Peter prayed for Tabitha. He didn't pray for Tabitha. This is just a speculation. He commanded her to come back to life. 
Amen. He prayed probably before doing that to stir himself up, to build himself into, in faith. And then he went and commanded Tabitha to rise up back to life. Another example of tradition of men. Uh, this is the second example when, uh, that makes the word of God of no effect is praying to Jesus. And that might be a surprise. It was a surprise for me also when I got this revelation. But, and it may be a surprise for you. But let's see if that's true or not in the Bible. We judge the Catholics for praying to, to Mary and the Greek Orthodox for praying to saints. But we Christians do also something that is not in the Word of God. We pray to Jesus. And the Bible doesn't tell us to pray to Jesus. Did you know that the New Testament doesn't teach you to pray to Jesus? That might be something new. But let's see. This is very subtle. And we do it because everybody does it. We pray to Jesus. But let's read John chapter 16 verses 23 to 24. And in that day, Jesus says, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Can you see what Jesus says here? What is that day? Is the day after his resurrection. Is the day of the new covenant. Is the day of the new creation. Jesus is saying here that we will not ask him anything after he is resurrected and ascended to heaven. However, we will ask the Father in Jesus' name. Anything we need to ask, we ask the Father. And we hear all the time prayers like this. Oh, dear Jesus, we just ask you right now, dear Jesus, to intervene in this situation in the name of Jesus. How can you ask Jesus in the name of Jesus? That's nonsense. We ask the Father in the name of Jesus. We don't ask to Jesus in the name of Jesus. And I'll give an example. It's like I go to my father and I ask him to, use, I ask him to give me permission to use his car and to give me his keys. And he says yes, but he sends me to my mother to, to pick up the keys for the car. And then I come back to him again. Father, I need your car. I need permission to use your car. But the father already said yes. He just told me to go to the, my mother to pick up the keys. And that's what we do in the spiritual things. The, Jesus told us to go to the Father in, the name, in His name and ask for anything. Not to go to Him. But we still go to Him and we mix the two. Jesus came to bring us to the Father because the Bible says the Father Himself loves us. You cannot pray, Robert, can you please help me, Cornelio? Dear Florine, I just want you to intervene. And we do this like Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't even know to whom we pray anymore. This is a shotgun prayer which shows that we don't have any confidence that there is an actual loving person there listening to us. We don't actually have faith in that kind of prayer. We need to think about our prayer. To whom do we pray? In, in whose name? We don't pray even to the Holy Spirit. Yes, we fellowship with Him. We ask Him for help. But uh, most of the thing, we ask the Father. And we don't pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. That was another example. So the, this is the second thing that is a big obstacle. It's a true obstacle uh, in, the, in the way of healing. Traditions of men. Things and wrong beliefs about healing, about sickness, about uh, uh, faith for healing. Uh, the first one was lack of knowledge. The second is traditions of men. And don't think that these traditions don't necessarily think about other religions. When I talk about traditions of men, I talk about traditions of men inside the church, inside the body of believers. There are so many traditions and unwritten rules, unwritten things that are subtle. They are in our minds and we're not even aware of them. But they are there producing doubt in our hearts. And we, we never get to experience the, experience the promises of God fulfilled in our lives. And we are taken advantage of by the devil. Amen. The third big true obstacle uh, in the way of healing is unbelief. And let's read Matthew 17, verses 14 to 21. The Bible says this, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. 
So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, from, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go except does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And we read this passage a few times in the previous sessions with different and we touch on different aspects and today we're touching specifically on unbelief. When the disciples asked Jesus why they couldn't cast out the demon, notice the first response coming out of Jesus' mouth in verse 17 and then verse 20. Oh, faithless generation. And then verse 20, because of your unbelief. These are the first words that came out of Jesus' mouth as a response to the disciples' question. The clear cause was unbelief on the disciples' part. And notice that Jesus didn't say, well, you know, you got to trust God. He knows what he's doing. The Lord knows. You don't have to worry about it. If he wanted this boy healed, he would be healed. Jesus didn't say that. And we hear this kind of talk all the time in, in some churches. But unbelief is another big reason. It's the first one that I'm talking about today. It's another big reason. It's a true obst obstacle that Jesus gave for why people are not getting healed or delivered. And notice also that Jesus is not saying, you guys, you know you cannot do that. I mean, I am the son of God. Only I can do that. Did Jesus say that? No, of course not. He's the one that sent them out, gave them authority to cast out demons, and they went out and did that. Jesus wasn't a socialist. He didn't want to, he didn't send the disciples and told them, you go and fast and pray. You go and sanctify yourself, become first holy, and go and find out the cases that need healing, and then call me because I'm the one that needs to perform those healings. No. He just gave them freedom. He gave them authority. Go and heal, heal them yourself. You don't need me. It's not because I am the son of God. You can do that. So Jesus didn't say that. And then we, they knew, the disciples knew that they could do it. That's why they tried. Otherwise, they wouldn't even have tried to cast out the demon. But they knew they could. But something happened while they were trying. Because Jesus said they were in unbelief. Even if they thought they believed, as so many times we think, Jesus told them, you were in unbelief. And since Jesus said it was unbelief, it means that if the disciples were really believing, they would have produced results. That means faith always works. Faith always works, no matter what we think. Faith, if you have faith, it will work. If it didn't work and didn't produce results, then that faith was either completely blocked from your spirit to come out on the exterior, or it came some out, but it was too weak to overcome that problem. You had too much unbelief in your mind blocking, and you had some faith coming out, released out of you, some power, but not enough to overcome that problem. And we notice that Jesus didn't do anything different from what the disciples did. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked him, why could we not cast it out if Jesus did something different? If Jesus did something different, they would have known immediately what they, why they couldn't do it because they would have seen him. Oh yeah, we did that, but Jesus did that. And that's why we, did, we could not cast it out. But Jesus did the same thing as them. That's why they came and asked. He didn't do anything different. But there was a difference. The only difference between Jesus and them was what? Was faith. He had more faith released out of him. He didn't have any unbelief. So he was able to overcome that, that uh, demon. And what happened there was, I think it was something similar to Peter walking on the water. 
because he started walking on the water and he walked on the water as long as his focus and eyes were fixed on Jesus. He started walking and he was looking at Jesus. He was believing Jesus. He was not looking anywhere else. But the moment he began looking at the waters, he started looking at the water, he took his eyes, his mind, his focus from what Jesus said, come, and he started looking at the waters. Doubt entered his heart and he began sinking. And that's what happens so many times when we take our mind, our focus from the word of God and we allow things from exterior for our five senses to come into our mind and distract us and we, we let unbelief slide in into our minds. And, then when we, and that, that is a time when we begin sinking. And in a similar way, the disciples here might have started commanding. I mean, I, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. They might have tried, started commanding the demon to leave. But when the demon started manifesting badly, and we see that a lot of things, the passages in Matthew and Mark, they show us a lot of, of external things. Uh, man manifestations happening when they try to cast that demon out. And I don't think it's by coincidence. So this guy, this boy manifested badly. They allowed doubt to come into their heart and become doubtful. And in Mark 6 verses 1 to 6 account, Jesus asked the father, how long had that child been like that? And the father answered that it was from childhood. And imagine that if the disciples by any chance asked the men the same question, the same thing before Jesus came and received the same answer, then on top of the extreme external manifestations, the longevity of that possession from childhood would, they, would have shrunk their faith even more. I mean, that's what happens. Put yourself in their shoes. If, you, if, you, if you're trying to pray for something that you hear, it's from birth, it's from childhood. For some reason, it becomes more difficult for God in our minds. We, re we receive unbelief. And I think this, the disciples were taken by surprise. They were not prepared for that kind of uh, opposition and that kind of unbelief. And I want to take the time here and talk a little bit about why it is more difficult and why we, we have a little bit more unbelief in our heart. We need to fight a little bit more unbelief in our heart. When we try to minister healing to ourselves or to our family members, or to our close friends. That doesn't mean this is always the case, and that we cannot overcome this kind of unbelief. It's just that sometimes it poses a little more difficulty, but we can always overcome. And even in some cases, it might not happen at all. You can be so detached from the situation that, and have faith that it will not happen to us. But I'm just saying here that sometimes it's a little bit more difficult and I want to say why. The first big reason is familiarity and how well the person ministering is known by the person ministered to with, together with all the goods and bads. How well does the person that you're trying to minister you to knows you with your good sides and bad sides? That's what we're talking about here. When you minister to someone you know well, you are conscious of how well they know you with your weaknesses and bad deeds and habits. And you cannot portray yourself anymore. You cannot portray anymore that spiritual image of the man of God in front of them that will give you more confidence, more faith. And it just attacks your mind and undermines your faith even without you not, know, not knowing many times. The same happens to the person you minister to. Because they know you so well. Remember how people in Jesus' hometown were offended at him, at him because of familiarity and had unbelief in their hearts. They were offended at Jesus. And they might not trust your prayer so much. The person that you're trying to minister, they might, they might not trust your prayer so much because you are not as spiritual in their eyes like other people of God, like other men and women of God. Plus, family and friends that know you very well rarely believe that you can change, that you can be a different person and, and that you can be used by God in a mighty way. I don't know why, but the, in many times that's the truth. So there is unbelief on both sides most of the time. The same thing, I mean, in, in the side of you ministering to because you know how well the person knows you and also the person that you're trying to minister to because they know you also. And there's unbelief on both sides that try to undermine the faith. And the same thing happens when there is a guest speaker in your church 
calling people for prayer at the end of the service. People will want more to be ministered by that new preacher that they don't know anything about instead of their own pastor whom they know. Or if you as a pastor go minister in another place where you are not known very well, both you will have more confidence to minister, uh, to minister to people and the people minister to will have more faith in your prayer. Isn't that true? Have you discovered that? Have you ever faced that? And that is why also more miracles happen when you're away from your church. As a pastor, I mean. And I will also say this here, which is interesting. The closer you get to your pastor or to a man of God, and the more you know them intimately, or if you have a family relation, you're a son, a father and son, or father and daughter, and you are all together in ministry, usually you can expect that less faith you will have in them as spiritual leaders. You will, you will look less to them as spiritual leaders and more like friends because you're very familiar with them. And it shouldn't be like that, but many times it happens that way. You're either good friends with them and you'll search for uh, important spiritual guidance somewhere else or you'll keep the distance and still see them as your spiritual leaders. Because when we come close to a so-called man of God, we, we begin discover, discovering the, the truth that they are humans too, like us, and they have uh, the bad sides like us, they have weaknesses. And when we see that, our mind immediately, our minds immediately receive doubt that they cannot minister to us, they cannot receive for, from God from us uh, since they have the, all those things in their lives. And you discover that they are actually like you, or maybe you think you're better than them, uh, and your faith in their ministry decreases. The second big reason why, uh, why it's hard to minister to close friends or family or to yourself is the longevity or uh, incurability of a sickness. The longer a sickness has been in someone's body or the more incurable that sickness is, the less faith you seem to have to pray for that sickness. Isn't that right? Have you ever been faced with this? You didn't know why that happened, but it just happened. For some reason, when our minds hear that a sickness has been from childhood, or someone was born with it, or that that sickness is incurable, like cancer, HIV, they are more, we are more prone to unbelief. That's how our minds work. That happens also when you pray for healing for yourself first. That sickness might have been with you for some time, day and night, you're with it in your body and you're conscious of it and you know it very well. Maybe you prayed many times for it and it didn't go, you didn't have results. And second, you know yourself very well with all your faults and all that creates a considerable amount of unbelief that we need to fight against more than usual. And that unbelief blocks most of the time you, our healing from flowing into us or into our close friends or family. However, if someone else with faith whom you don't know very well and who doesn't know you and your sickness very well prays for you, you might see instant results. And that happens so many times. That is why sometimes it's better to know less information about the person you minister to or about their sickness because it will help your faith to not know too much. And you don't even need to know too much because whatever it is, you have the life of God in you and it can overcome and destroy any sickness. The more you know, the more you're prone to unbelief. And the same happens in prophecy. The less you know about the person that you're trying to minister to, the better the prophecies flow. And I've experienced that firsthand. The more you know the person, it's, it's, it becomes more difficult to prophesy over them. But if you don't know them, then it's easier to have faith to prophesy because anything that you receive you know for sure that it's from God. The third reason uh, uh, why this is a little bit more difficult is a too strong emotional involvement with the person being ministered to. Think about a mother who sees her child dying of a terminal disease. The fear of losing her child will most of the time be stronger than faith because we see the child struggling. We, we see, we have five senses and whatever we see and touch and smell and hear, it's many times stronger than our faith. It overcomes our faith. 
and her emotional involvement will generate tears of desperation and that doesn't help faith because heaven doesn't respond to tears. Heaven responds to faith. And that is why it's so hard also to raise a dead person because everyone is crying at a funeral and that affects negatively the faith of anyone trying to raise that person up back to life. However, if Jesus was able to repel the cries of people of the funeral of that little girl that died, then we can too. We just need more fasting and prayer as Jesus recommended. That kind of unbelief doesn't come out except through fasting and prayer. And to be able to stand strong in faith in our minds in such a situation, we need fasting and praying, as I said. Fasting, why do we need fasting? Because fasting trains our mind to say no to the external senses, to the external stimuli, or whatever we receive through our five senses. Fasting trains our mind to say no to food. And when we learn to say no to food, by analogy, that kind of training and faith will leak into other areas. Then we'll know in other areas how to say no and how to repel the, what we receive through the five senses and be strong and firm in our minds. And praying in tongues, what does that do to our faith? It allows the Holy Spirit, the inner witness, to testify to our hearts about the truth of God and to convince our mind, to strengthen our mind, to strengthen our conviction and our resolve. That's what the praying in tongues does. You allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you and to talk through you and your ears hear what you're speaking. And that's how the Holy Spirit, that's, that's one of the things I believe prayer in tongues does. Because the, it says that prayer in tongues, when you pray in the Spirit, it builds yourself up. It builds you in the Spirit. It builds your faith. So it testifies to your heart. It convinces your heart because faith happens in the heart. Romans 10 says that with, with, the, heart, with the heart one believes. Faith happens in the heart. So our, the inner witness, our helper, the Holy Spirit, when you pray in tongues, you allow him to, to convince your heart, to testify the word, to put the word in you and to build it into you so that you believe easier and reject easier whatever you see or people's unbelief. And notice, now if we come back to the, the passage about that boy where, when, people, when the disciples couldn't cast out the demon, notice that it's the disciples' unbelief. It is our responsibility as Christians to exercise faith and produce results. It is not God's responsibility, nor of a sick person, nor of the sick person. That's in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God was coming and healing his people. People would cry, would fast, would implore God to come. That's where we take the imploration. They would implore God to have mercy on them and then God would come from heaven and heal them. But that was in the Old Testament because people were under the dominion of darkness. Nobody had already had paid yet for their sins and for their healing, to have access to healing. It was something that they need to ask God mercy for. They, need, they needed to ask God for it and implore God for it and convince God to give it to them. And God would give it to them because of his mercy. But in the New Testament, we no longer pray to God. It's not his responsibility to heal people. He has already given us healing. He has already healed us by his stripes and he sent us to heal the people. He will not come and heal the people. It's not his responsibility. And Jesus made that very clear through the following expressions in this passage that we just read. Because of your unbelief. Another expression. If you have faith as a master, as a master seed. Then another one. You will say to the mountain. Not God, not Jesus. You will say to the mountain. You will command to the mountain. Move from here to there. You see, it's a command. Move. Mountain, move from here to there. That's how we need to talk to sickness. Sickness, go in the name of Jesus. Then another expression. Nothing will be impossible to you. Not to God. We know that all things are possible to God. Nothing is impossible for God. But Jesus says here, nothing will be impossible to you. Probably you, you read this verse so many times and you just passed by very quickly not noticing what actually Jesus tells you. 
There is not, nothing is impossible to us. And that's powerful. Now, when the disciples asked Jesus privately, he also didn't say in verse 20 something like this. Now, you guys, you know, it, this, you could not cast this demon out because it was not the right timing of the Lord. God had to wait, wanted to wait another 15 minutes until we came back from the mountain. And then it was the perfect timing of God for that healing to take place. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't mention anything about perfect timings. Do you know that for a lot of the promises of God, the time is now. The promises of God are now. It's for now. And we are still not getting them. When it comes to healing, there's not a time when God wants us to be sick. Any of us. Our healing, your healing was paid for in full 2,000 years ago. And God is not holding back healing from anyone in the body of Christ or outside of the body of Christ. If we are ministering to them. He doesn't just say once in a while, oh, now is your time to be healed. Now is not time to be healed. But now it's your time to be healed. And you hear some preachers, now it's your time. It's your season. So it's always your time to be healed. That's the truth from the Bible. It's always your time to be healed of any sickness, anytime, anywhere. And that's, a, and that's a tradition about timing. This issue of timing, perfect timing, it's a tradition of men, as I mentioned earlier. Traditions of men. And it's not in the Word of God. He heals all our diseases by His stripes. 1 Peter 2.24 says, we were healed. Amen. And the way we get saved is is not by the faith of God or whenever God wants us to save wants to save us how did we get saved how did you get saved was it by the faith of God no it was by your faith was it whenever God wanted to save you no it was whenever you wanted to get saved isn't that right that's how it was with me at least and we are saved at the time of our individual faith and confession of the word. Romans 10, 9 to 10 says this. The same is with all the promises of God about us. It's up to us. It's up to you to be saved. And it's up to you to be healed and receive answers to prayers. It's up to us. In the same manner as it's up to us to be saved, it's also up to us to be healed or receive answers to prayers. It's not the God's fault. It's not that it's not God's will. It's not, it's not, the reason is not uh, imperfect timing. The reason is with us and our unbelief. And as seen in the passage above, unbelief as a cause applies only to the person ministering the healing and not to the person being ministered to. And that's important. The unbelief, of the unbelief of the person ministering can be the obstacle and not the unbelief of the person being ministered to. If the person being ministered to has faith, that's even better. They, you, they put their faith together with your faith. But people's unbelief, if you read in the Bible, in the Gospels, never stopped Jesus from healing all of them unless they didn't come to him altogether because of unbelief. And they didn't give him permission to minister on them like it happened in his hometown. They were offended and they didn't even come to Jesus to be ministered to. And this is a level that few believers reach where they take responsibility because it is always very difficult to admit. And that's the truth that we ourselves are the problem. It's very difficult to admit. Many times we confuse responsibility with condemnation. And because of that, we run from it. We run from this responsibility. We don't want to be condemned. God doesn't condemn. We don't want to be condemned and discouraged. And that's why we run from taking responsibility to, to heal the sick. But what if we ran from the responsibility of being saved? Because the gospel is condemning. It says that you are a sinner. You were a sinner and you need salvation. And there, in, in a very well, that word can condemn you. Right? But you don't run from that condemnation, from that responsibility. You come and you get saved because there's hope. And another thing, the Bible says that before you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit convinces the world of sin. So when the gospel is preached to you, was preached to you, the Holy Spirit was convincing you of sin. 
Not condemning you, but it's sin. It felt like condemnation, but it wasn't condemnation. But after you come into Christ, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convinces his believer, the body of Christ, of righteousness. He will never condemn you again of sin. So we confuse responsibility with condemnation, condemnation and that's why we run from it. And even those who reach this level of awareness and responsibility, they usually look first in the wrong place for the cause. They for the cause of why things not ha don't, don't happen. They believe correctly that they are the problem. They, they are in the un an unbelief. But it is because of some sin in their lives or because they have not enough faith, uh, faith in their faith. They have faith in their faith and not in the word of God. And we'll cover that later on. The only real cause and problem when it's in our, on our side, it's unbelief in the word. Meaning that they have faith maybe in the word, but it is not strong enough. You are not convinced enough. You are not persuaded. You are not fully persuaded as the Bible says about Abraham. You need to be fully persuaded about the word of God in order to see things happening. And being in unbelief, which is the real cause, means one of the two things. First, it's either we do not have yet enough understanding or knowledge of the things of God and how they work. As I, said, as I mentioned, the first real obstacle, lack of knowledge. We don't have enough understanding and that's why we're teaching here to, to have more understanding. And second, or we might have understanding, but the faith in that understanding is not strong enough or consistent enough. Meaning that it did not penetrate the core of our hearts. We know the truth, but we're not yet fully convinced because we need to refresh our minds uh, consistently with the word of God, meditate on it, pray in tongues, declare the word of God so that we, will, we renew our mind. And that truth, it doesn't penetrate just the conscious mind. That's not enough. It has to penetrate the core of our hearts, the subconscious, or the, or, uh, that place where is the long-term memory, where our emotions are formed, where our, uh, our full personality is developed. Where, where when, when you're waking up in the middle of the night and you don't have time to think and you, you're asked something, you, you respond, you respond from your heart. You don't have time to think. So the word of God has to penetrate that level of our hearts because in the heart, faith happens. Not in our conscious mind, not, not in our rational mind. When we are acquainted, just acquainted with the, with the word of God. The word of God needs to become us. We need to put flesh to the word of God and to, to uh, ingest that word of God until it becomes us. It becomes part of us. And I want to give an example here. Peter's claim from Luke 22 verse 33 and Matthew 26 verse 35, they are parallel accounts, that he will never betray Jesus but he will die for Jesus was full of faith and confidence at the time that he made the claim. You know when they were sitting around at the table? And I don't think he lied when he said that. He was full of energy, full of faith. He, when he said, I will die for you, Jesus. He meant it with all his being. However, when he was faced with the soldiers, the problem, and when he was faced with death, because he didn't pray like Jesus. You know, when Jesus told them in the garden, come and pray with me. Come and watch with me. He, they didn't pray. He didn't pray, but he slept and wasn't sober. And fear, because he, he wasn't stirred up, he wasn't, his mind was sleepy, his, he was sleeping. Fear gripped his heart and blocked his confidence from yielding the expected results or fruits of the initial claim. Meaning, to actually die for Jesus, as he said before. He wasn't able, because he, was not, he did not pray, uh, and he did not fast, and his mind was not ready. Fear gripped his heart when he was faced with the issue. Unbelief gripped his heart. That is why we need to pray and be constantly on the alert and in faith. You need to check your heart if you're confident, always. And if you're not, if you feel weak, if you feel human, you are discouraged, you need to pray. Because you are very vulnerable in that moment. If an attack from the devil comes, you will not have enough faith. You will not be uh, in faith to be able to reject and repel those attacks. And unbelief will come very easily. Unbelief and fear will grip your heart very easily. And I, I'm explaining this a little bit more in detail so that we understand the dynamics. And to understand that we are interested in prayer. 
it doesn't do God uh, any good. We are praying also, we are praying mostly for ourselves and for us to be in faith. And when we pray, of course, we thank God, we do all, all, that, all, that, all those things, but we also build ourselves in, in, in faith. And the Bible always tells us, even in Ephesians, when the Bible presents the armor of God, he tells us praying, praying in the spirit without ceasing. You always need to be in an atmosphere of prayer. Praying in, and praying in tongues can help us in that because you don't need your conscious mind always involved, but you are still praying in the spirit. You are in a, in a, in a state of faith. You are stirred up all the time. And now I'll, I'm coming to a close uh, about this uh, true obstacle to healing unbelief by saying this. The only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe that there are hindrance, hindrances to healing. And I'll say it again. The only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe that there are hindrances to healing. The minute you believe that there is a hindrance to healing, you automatically become doubtful and double-minded and you cannot receive anything from the Lord. And that's what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. See how harsh seems the Bible to be? He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Here it talks about wisdom, but we can apply that to anything else. Healing, victory, anything that we pray for. The fact that we're double-minded doesn't mean that God doesn't still give healing. He has already given it to us. The passage above doesn't say that God won't give wisdom or healing or anything if we, if we are double-minded. The Bible doesn't say that. He, God is always willing. He always wants promises to come to pass. He will still give it. But the passage says instead that you cannot receive it. We cannot receive it. The problem is on our side. God can still give it and we won't receive it. Because we're double-minded, because of unbelief. So healing, the provision of healing is always flowing. It has already been given. But we are many times not able to receive it because of the blockage of unbelief. Amen? And that's a true obstacle in the way of healing. And the fourth true obstacle in the way of healing is the devil, of course. Any hindrance to the healing of any person is not of God, as I said before in a previous session. Anything that seems to try to stop you is not from God. God is never trying to stop us in any way from ministering healing to others for, or getting healed. If there is anything trying to keep us from getting healed is not of God, but of the devil. And Isaiah 54 verse 17 says this. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. The pa this passage doesn't say that weapons will not be formed against us. Because they will. However, it says that they will not prosper against us. They will not prosper. And then John 10 verses 8 to 10 says this. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. This is our Jesus. This is our Lord and King. The promises don't always work because between God and us, there is also a thief. There is also the devil. If there was no devil and just us and God, it would be a piece of cake to receive healing. But there's a thief who is also called the deceiver and his job is to get you twisted around in your thinking so that you cannot receive from God. That's his job. His job is to deceive us and to make us believe something that is not true. That's what the devil's job is. And there's only one way to beat the devil. 
and to beat sickness by staying in the word by staying with the word of god jesus always answered during his temptation with the word it is written it is written that's why it's so important to have the word of god in you not just worship not just it, worship is important and being in the presence of god and allowing the holy spirit to work in us that's important it's very important but more more important than that is the word of god because the word of god is not dry it's not lifeless actually the power of god and the the way the holy spirit is released is in the word is in his word the word is the power of god the word of the cross the bible says is the power of god the son of god himself who was the word made flesh jesus was the word and he himself he answered only with what was written in the word imagine jesus the way he thought he thought only with the word and he was the word how much more we need the word of god in order to be able to beat the devil it is true that the devil is the main cause the direct cause of sickness and the source of deception however he is not really a factor according to the bible the devil if if we stick with the word he's not really a factor his only power is deception he doesn't have real power and authority over us christian he can only deceive us through the senses through traditions of man through different things uh, very uh, subtle doubts in our mind that's how he fights that's his only power satan has some ability and power which he abuses against us but he doesn't have authority over christians to do these things so we'll close here we covered a lot today and we're, we're also closing chapter five so we did one big chapter in one session and today we talked about the true obstacles to healing which were lack of knowledge uh, traditions of man unbelief and the devil himself and in our next session we're in chapter six we'll learn how to believe how to release faith how does faith work how our brain and minds work to to grow in, in in faith in the word of god exciting things and now we'll also talk about the science of renewing our mind of our brain of neuroscience it's exciting and until we see each other again in the next session i pray that god would bless you and cause you to grow in his in the full stature of christ to grow in knowledge and understanding to grow in faith and to grow into him in all areas of your life in the name of jesus amen